Hello, welcome. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you Delphi Forum for having us. Uh, my name is Andreas Gandorf. I'll be your moderator today. And today's session is titled Decarbonization, How Far Can Renewables Go? Now, before we go into the conversation today, I want to set the scene a little bit. Um, so when we think about decarbonization, most people think about wind and solar. And of course, you wouldn't be wrong to think about that. If you look at the EU27 over the last 20 years, they've essentially installed 166 gigawatts of uh, wind capacity, 138 gigawatts of solar. To put that into perspective, take uh, Italy's power system plus Spain's power system. That's essentially how much capacity we've put on the ground. These two technologies have gone from contributing. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, these two technologies have essentially gone from contributing 3% of electricity generation in 2000 to 20% in 2020. Again, putting that into perspective, it's more than coal or uh, gas contributed in that individual year when it comes to electricity generation. When we look into the future, at, at least out, uh, out until 2030, these two technologies remain key uh, in decarbonization. Some facts are the um, Fit for 55 package that the European Commission put forward uh, essentially calls for 65% renewables in electricity generation by 2030. If we look at some individual countries, we see shares as high as 70%, for example, in Spain. Yet, the energy transition is not, is not just about electricity and it's not just about renewables. When we look at the picture as a whole, uh, we see that even electricity, for example, cannot go all the way with just technologies like wind and solar. At the same time, there are other sectors, take heat decarbonization, transport decarbonization, energy intensive industry that today don't necessarily have alternatives uh, to burning fossil fuels. And the few alternatives that might exist are not commercially viable for another 10, uh, sorry, for another one, two or three decades. So in the meantime, we need some solutions. In that context, uh, in today's uh, conversation with my panelists, we're gonna talk about how far technologies like wind and solar can take us. And at the same time, what are some other options that we have in the race to zero and net zero, however you wanna see, um, that can bridge us between today and uh, true alternatives to fossil fuels. Joining me here today are uh, Sophocles Papanicolaou, founder and CEO of Blue Grid, uh, Aristotelis Handavas, head of uh, NL Green Power for Europe and president of Solar Power Europe. Costas Papamandelos, global head energy transition investments at RWE Supply and Trading, and at the same time, CEO of uh, RWE Hellas. And finally, Theodor Tsakiris, associate professor for energy policy at the University of Nicosia. Please uh, welcome, me, uh, welcome our speakers with a round of applause before we begin. Costa, I will quickly start with you the conversation today. So I painted a picture of where renewables have taken us from 2000 to 2020. Do you agree with the picture I painted or do you think there's more to it? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Uh, I, I agree that there is you know, not a single recipe uh, for the energy transition. For, uh, I firmly believe that at the end it has to be a combination of investments into um, into onshore and offshore winds, into solar PV, into batteries. Uh, we need a hydrogen economy and we need flexible power generation. You know, that is at the end the mix that is going to be required. Uh, and uh, the different technologies have different levels of maturity. Uh, uh, the investment vehicle I run with in RWE, we invested into an energy storage company in California uh, 2015 at that time. It was a Series C funding, so kind of VC type of investment. And uh, six years later, uh, you don't yet still the build, you don't see yet the build out of, of battery storage that is required to facilitate the growth of the more conventional renewables. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Aristotele, actually seeing that uh, Costa spoke a lot about the future and what's going on, you work for NL, and NL has very ambitious plans to grow uh, over the next 10 years, definitely. So what do you see the role of wind and solar being in the next decade, uh, especially in Europe? Let's keep this in a European context. I think it's uh, fundamental. I mean, uh, 
this is uh, even today's crisis demonstrates very clearly that uh, wind and solar should be the drivers in this energy transition effort. Uh, we talk about uh, sources that uh, can assure geopolitical independence in uh, different nations. At the same time, they are by far, in most of the countries uh, around the globe, the lowest cost generation technologies. And uh, in my view, that's why also their position in the business plan of Enel is a key. Enel is a, a, has turned clearly into renewables the last uh, 15 years. And for us, uh, this is the only path ahead. I see. And uh, I'm assuming you have uh, quite ambitious plans to grow them both in Greece and in Europe. Yes, uh, I think that uh, our uh, business plan is uh, by far the most ambitious today. And they'll uh, will install around 160 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy by 2030. To make this happen, we accelerated during the last three years uh, the pace in uh, our, uh, let's say, pipeline, in our renewables pipeline. We have today more than 350 gigawatts around the world. And uh, with, um, let's say, different uh, business cases that we are building together, of course, with storage or hydrogen projects for the future, we think that uh, this can be a reality. And that's why our uh, business plan is uh, based on these uh, assumptions. Theodore, if I can ask you a question, looking back again, um, yeah. what are some of the factors that contributed to the success of wind and solar becoming the technologies of choice, at least in this period, uh, for decarbonization? Do they have some inherent advantages over other technologies, or was it just a question of subsidies and growing them to scale? Well, primarily it was a an issue of subsidies have been subsidized systematically in Europe through the feed-in tariff for more than 25 years. They've broken even and above what would be their comparative cost in terms of a levelized cost of electricity, of a levelized cost of electricity with regards to gas. But they still have two major disadvantages. The one is efficiency compared to nuclear, compared to hydro, compared to the last generation of gas-fired plants, can go up to 65%. And more important than that, because is the fact that they are intermittent, they're stochastic through their own nature. So. They are the spearheads of the transition, but just I'm not, I'm not trying to jump into the, the next session, the next part of your questions, but they can't do everything alone. And there are also planning permitting issues with regards to, to the size, especially for onshore wind, uh, that uh, unfortunately there are local resistance factors on how quickly and how big they can expand. That's why the solution to that would be in Europe and, and of course, to a certain extent, increase offshore renewable, going offshore, which would limit significant amount of, of, of problems in terms of permitting and in terms of, of, of local um, ne potential negative local reaction. So this is, this is part of, 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 uh, of, of the solution. There are definitely the spearheads, okay? The avant-garde and the spearheads of the solution, but in and of themselves, they have significant restrictions that have to be complemented through different technological developments, including, obviously, hydrogen. So just to stay on what you just said, in a way you described them as spearheads, but at the same time you said they need complementarity. Yeah. Looking at the EU policy for the next 10 years, let's say, until 2030, do you agree with the approach that has been taken, which has essentially put them at the forefront and um, the term like is using them as a key driver, or do you think more needs to be done in other technologies that you also mentioned, like nuclear or hydrogen or batteries? No, I believe that they are the spearhead, obviously, but they need a lot of support in terms of storage. We need storage, we need high level storage, we need better storage and better efficiency. Even our own uh, National Energy and Climate Plan envisions 1.5 gigawatts of, of installed electricity capacity which would be less than, about less than 10% of what we consume today in terms of peak demand. Uh, there are two major technologies, pump storage, as you know, which would give us a maximum amount of six hours, and the batteries would give us a maximum of two hours. So 
uh, as we grow, we need more interconnections, first of all. And eventually, we would need something that would be very easily stored, and we have the, the maximum amount of efficiency that could complement what the renewables are doing. That's the hydrogen strategy, but it takes years for it to develop. It's an entirely new market. It's an entirely new infrastructure. So we have to, to, to use uh, the examples and the knowledge we've gained from gas to complement the way that we're going to, to build this market. And of course, start by, by, f by allowing all technologies, sorry, all technologies to flourish in this regard, because we need more hydrogen as quickly as possible. And of course, green will come up as the technology arises and the costs drop. And of course, uh, uh, the other technology, and in terms of EU policy, there has been a significant shift. And I'm not referring to the fact that several countries, because of the need to, to get away from Russian gas, are trying to shift back to coal, because this is a very, very short, I hope, detour. Okay? The st strategic, uh, for the last 10 years at least, recalibration, if you'd like, of EU policy before, uh, which started even before the Russian-Ukrainian war, has been through, and that has been evident through um, the taxonomy uh, regulation, a re-emphasis on nuclear, obviously, uh, and even small-scale nuclear, and on the other side, gas. Gas, but admi ad in admixtures of hydrogen okay. over 10 to 15 years from now. Thank you. And Thank you. Ari Aristotelia, I want to touch upon another issue that Theodore mentioned, which is local opposition. This has been tout touted by many people as the main obstacle to the growth of renewables, especially as we're reaching higher and higher levels of penetration. Have you experienced this, and how have you dealt with this in, in the recent past? Yes, I, I think it's uh, one of the main factors that sometimes is a delay in permitting, uh, both for uh, realistic reasons and also because it's also the perfect excuse for the different authorities not to act uh, in a timely manner. On the other hand, uh, this is something that uh, is being increasing uh, year by year. We see it everywhere, in every technology. Um, uh, Enel took it uh, very seriously the last, I would say, five, six years. Uh, together with uh, Harvard University, we tried to uh, import in all our activities, in all our business cases, the term of sustainability. What does it mean? That we try to uh, act in a sustainable banner, manner and create shared value with the local communities <coughs> that we invest. Practically what we say, we don't want to invest where they don't want us. So step by step, we try to create value with the local communities. We try to uh, help them increase their, uh, let's say, GDP gradually increase, let's say, uh, the, the way, uh, the quality of their lives, and that makes it easier. Of course, it's not the solution to every problem. There are uh, societies that, let's say, pre in principle, uh, never want to, 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 to comply with, and for us, okay, fortunately, due to the size of our pipeline, we have alternatives, but I think that it could be very wise for uh, all uh, uh, the, the, the investors and at the same time the policy makers to incorporate uh, sustainability into every action from the decision making, from the design of the project to the construction and its operation and maintenance which brings together the investor and the, and the local community. Andreas, if I may I, I yes. ask something on that. Um, I think you're fully right and at the end engaging with the local community is key. We need to take the arguments very serious and we, have, we need to have the dialogue. But let's remember that society plays an important role in the energy transition. And at some point, you know, the common good needs to be in front of individual interests, yeah. right? Uh, um, uh, and I think the, the, um, the framework can help. Let's say onshore wind is one of the most tricky parts. So one of the ideas would be why not support dedicating you know, specific areas in countries and say, you know, this is going to be for onshore wind. That helps that discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the comment. Now, so for clear, I would like to come to you. We've talked about renewables, wind, solar, means some mention of uh, nuclear. Are there other decarbonizing forces in the meantime between 
even now that we've seen over the last 20 years that can help reduce emissions even though they're not, let's say, acceptable in the wider public as being advertised as such? Uh, sure, yeah, there are. Uh, first of all, I think we can all accept that no technology has been as effective um, in reducing direct emissions uh, over the past 15 to 20 years as wind and solar has been. That being said, there are other initiatives and technologies um, that do lead to the same um, consequences, the same effects, albeit at a maybe smaller degree, but hold a lot of promise going forward. One of them I can think of that I don't think has been mentioned is the demand side, energy efficiency, smarter buildings, better insulation, weatherization, lead lighting, um, combined heat and power applications that increase efficiency, uh, better urban planning, uh, increasing pedestrian use, reducing use of vehicles, um, as well as making vehicles more efficient as well through plug-in hybrids, electrification, and gasification. And uh, gasification of transport is something that I think will uh, be with us for a very long time. It's an important trend, and it regards looking at the heavier, let's say, part of transport, heavy-duty trucks, which, if I'm not mistaken, are responsible for about 25% of transportation emissions in Europe and finding better ways to fuel them, alternatives to diesel. Such alterna alternatives exist today. LNG is one of them. Uh, renewable LNG will be one of them in the future. ELNG may be another one. Uh, hydrogen may be another one. So there are many technologies that we can think about that will lead us to reducing carbon in transport. And one last thing that I want to mention, if you don't mind, even though, even though it's not, it doesn't come from a European perspective, but it comes from a global perspective, we all live in the same planet. We all bear the consequences of carbon emissions, whether they are produced in Europe or in Southeast Asia. Um, so we should not be, um, let's say, too critical about securing natural gas supply chains, production, and delivery, because possibly the most effective and direct decarbonization initiative that I at least can think of is coal to gas switching in Asia um, and in other developing countries, which will need to raise their standards of living and will need to consume energy, and right now do not have the luxury that we do to think of technologies on the frontier. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sophocle. Now, Costa, I'd like to come back to you and, um, you know, start us moving towards the next part of the discussion, just looking at a little bit where can renewables take us. And in that context, I, you know, decarbonization strategies appear to be focused around electrification and greening electrification. But what other paths are there? And is it worth talking about them or have we found the, the way forward? We definitely need to talk about them, but talking is not enough. We need to act on them. I mean, the targets are clear. We said, you know, we need more renewables faster in the system, number one. Second, we need to build out uh, the electricity network. Third, we need to build uh, an, an hydrogen economy. And fourth, we need to find ways to help, ways to help the industry to decarbonize. So let me pick up on the last two. Hydrogen. Uh, I think it is clear that hydrogen is not the way to decarbonize the passenger transport sector. That's not a solution. But it is a solution to decarbonize uh, uh, you know, the transport sector when it comes down to heavy duty trucks, aviation, maritime transportation, and industry. Industry, there are two specifics. It, uh, industries that you know, have high temperature in the processes like chemical and steel. So, we need to get uh, uh, the, the industry to start switching to uh, investing into hydrogen-ready setups. For that to happen, you know, the ultimate game is going to be, it has to be green hydrogen. We are all clear. But how long will that take? And the answer is going to take some time. So in the meantime, we need to start thinking about how much we really, uh, you know, um, Specific, we are about the color coding, the gray and the and the green and the blue and uh, 
the reality is it's going to start with gas, it's going to move into blue, and it's going to become green. And this is our end game. Uh, and I think it is really important when you start thinking about building out this hydrogen economy that the right framework is put in place, uh, uh, you know, and the, the infrastructure that is required for that requires that framework. That is the only way that you actually will get the end user who has the interest to be decarbonized to start thinking about, I need to be hydrogen ready for the future. Thank, thank you for that. Now, Aristotele, I'd like to come back to you and ask you about the limit of technologies like wind and solar. Where, where do we see that? Where, you know, at what point do we say, okay, we've, we've built enough, we need to find, the tech, you know, we need to make sure the technologies that Costa mentioned. And I'm not looking necessarily for a specific number here, but just an idea of like, when do we get there? No, I mean, uh, I definitely agree with Costa. I mean, uh, first of all, um, it's clear that renewables should be the main technology for generation. To do this, we need to accelerate permitting. This is the talk of the town the last weeks in Brussels. By mid-May, we will see, I, in my view, uh, let's say, very ambitious actions and ideas coming from Brussels to all the member states. The idea is to accelerate. How to accelerate? We need, of course, to boost public acceptance. We need to boost uh, the ability of renewables to be absorbed in the system. And there we have several topics that we have not touched efficiently yet. It's the underutilization of grids so mm -hmm. far. It's the co-location of renewables technology. We have a wind with an efficiency of 40%. If you add another solar there, you can go to 60. If you add the battery, you go to 80, 90. So, I mean, these things so far have not been touched. Also, repowering has not been touched, especially in the European South. We have many assets that operate for the last 15, 20 years with an old technology. It's like having an old car parked in the middle of Athens, and then you say, yes, he, this guy parked there 15 years ago, I don't move this car to go to, to, to bring a new one. So this is the two main, let's say, uh, ideas that we need to, 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 let's say, run through. In my view, of course, with today's technology, we know that hard to abate sectors cannot be uh, efficiently supported by renewables plus storage today. But on the other hand, this should not limit our ambition for renewables. We are too far even from the, let's say, point that we satisfy the needs that can be satisfied from renewables and storage. So we need to be more ambitious in renewables, more ambitious in solar, and prepare the infrastructure for uh, hydrogen when it's going to be ready to, to be implemented so, so that it can satisfy the hard to abate sectors or the heavy haul transport. The rest will be, in my view, electrified. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, Theodore, I would like to come to you and touch upon the issue of growth of renewables, but in, from a different perspective, that of geopolitical risk and energy of supply security. Do you see them, do you see renewables essentially and the energy transition as being a tool that will liberate Europe energetically or will it just constrain it into a new geopolitical reality? No, I think initially in the 1970s after the oil crisis of 1973 when it was the first birth of renewables as an attempt on the birth and the deployment of renewables, primarily in the United States and secondarily extend in Northeastern Europe, the primary motivation behind it was energy security. You know, there was a famous uh, uh, quote by President Carter at the time when he put his first uh, solar panel on top of the White House roof that was taken down by Reagan when he came to power a few years later, when he said the famous quote that nobody can embargo the sun, which is true. Energy security and, and, and the energy transition, the goals of the energy transition have never been more closely aligned than today. So definitely this is part of, of the question. Uh, one of the aspects, but one of the aspects that could complicate this process, though, and this is something we have, we're still haven't fully grasped in Europe, and in even globally, is what we call critical energy minerals. We don't want to wake up sometime 10 to 20 years from now and find out that the entire supply chain has been hijacked 
by Chinese political economy or economic stagecraft, which is, by the way, what's happening already now. Europe needs to develop its own mineral resources, which are necessary to sustain the energy transition, both in the electricity sector and to the other sectors, which are much harder to abate the amount of minerals in what is the infrastructure is 10 times bigger in some cases, depending on the mineral, on what is the, the, the mineral demand for conventional infrastructure. And most of it is outside Europe, okay? Uh, there were attempts to try to, to, to secure such a supply in Greenland. I don't know if you've, the, the reaction was very significant and that effort was blocked. There are significant potential reserves in Sweden, which again, you know, opening up a mine in Europe is not very, very, I mean, we talked about re local reaction against the uh, onshore wind. Try to convince somebody to open a mine of critical energy minerals in Europe. Good luck. Sincerely, very good luck with that. But that doesn't mean that Europe needs to wake up sometime in the next 10 to 15 years. And Europe is usually very, very late on waking up, as you may, as you probably recall, by present realities. And that happened with gas, even after three crises, and even after the first Russian-Ukrainian war, the Russian gas exports kept increasing, and dependence kept increasing. You can now can discuss the data, maybe in another panel. But the reality is, Europe needs to grow up geopolitically and think strategically on the aspects of the political economy of critical energy minerals. There is very little understanding of these new realities and these new prospective dangers. There are attempts to try to, to find a way of, of, of dealing with this issue and this prospective problem, but we need to do much more, and we need to do it much more in a much more coordinated fashion. Thank you. Uh, Costa, if I can come back to you, and uh, I, I had a few technologies I want to ask you about. One we've talked about quite extensively, batteries. What about the interconnectors, and what about demand response on the grid? What is their role in essentially helping us, first of all, ship electricity around, and second of all, shift our consumption patterns to when electricity is available? As I said before, I think part of uh, Part of the investments required um, will go into flexible power generation. Uh, this is a reality, and uh, that's going to be gas. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of one one part of the equation. Uh, now, interconnectors are are key, and especially if you think about this part of the world, where actually you have the right um, climate. For, for solar and wind, and onshore and offshore wind, you need to, and I'm not talking specifically for Greece only, right, all this southern uh, part of Europe, we need to start thinking what kind of investments are required to get exactly, you know, that part where it needs to be, uh, 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 you know, delivered to. So it is essential, and uh, uh, it's, it's just part of the investments required. And it's, I think, the second point I mentioned kind of we need to build out the, the electricity network. Um, I, I would like to uh, come back a bit to the point uh, that you made. It's, for, for me, one thing is when we, what's really important when we think about it, um, the, the growth of renewables is we need to guarantee, keep guaranteeing security of supply. Mm -hmm. now, this is essential, and that is going to uh, you know, be a part of the equation of how fast we can move. And I can only agree uh, um, with my colleague that uh, we're not fast enough. We need to be faster. I mean, as a company, our ambition is to, uh, to deploy 50 billion in renewables over the next 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and not only us, we need to walk the talk. Thank you. Thank you for that. Aristotele, if I can come to you with the same question on the role of interconnectors and the uh, demand response. Again, I'll say batteries, we've, we've mentioned them a few times and we've said, but I think these two technologies are, are interesting. From the point of view of being someone who is, let's say, stationed in Southern Europe, um, specifically Greece, um, 
do you see the role being more than just ship, being able to ship electricity around and essentially maybe also linking markets together and uh, creating, let's say, more stable prices or more, more friendly investment environments? No, I think that uh, definitely, especially demand response has proven to be a very, let's say, crucial element in uh, regulating the, the power that you can, let's say, send to the grid and uh, combine very well the, the technologies. Um, uh, I think that definitely a strong focus should be given in uh, creating the infrastructure and uh, the, the, all, uh, the, the foundation for what comes next. However, what I'd like to highlight is that uh, because even this is a kind of a common sense, a commodity today and after different phases of greenwashing, uh, we see what has happened in the last year. During the last year, the gas prices, the electricity prices have skyrocketed. Why? Because one country that is a big producer decided to bring a military force in the borders of another country and then start a war and whatever. Just this occasion has changed completely how we think about energy, about uh, how ambitious we want to be. Imagine what could happen with the climate change. Imagine what would happen if we had a couple of degrees more and more floods and more natural disasters. So it's not an element that we should neglect because we have been talking about it the last 20 years. So today we have the technology, we have the tools. There is no need to start the thinking of how we are going to continue different sectors and uh, practically uh, assure their continuity in the last 20 in the next 20 years while at the same time we have the solution in front of us mm -hmm. europe has proven that despite its inefficiency despite the old mines despite the the lack of uh, let's say governance to to coordinate 27 member states in covid they decided to procure vaccines they decided very quickly to deploy an emergency plan, and it worked with the mistakes that happened. This, in my view, should happen today for energy. And this also includes uh, what Theodore mentioned about the supply chain. And we see many steps. We have, as an L, we are building a solar factory in Catania in Italy. Mm -hmm. This will produce three gigawatts of panels. Of course, an L doesn't intend to become a manufacturer. Why we do it? We want to show to the rest of the world that Europe can manufacture equipment because in R&D we are better than the rest and also we can make the, say, the necessary steps to, to, to giving to the market a good product. And this is something that Europe must prioritize and I think that they have it in mind very seriously and while they procured massively vaccines, they can procure even minerals all together just to make sure that the industry in different sectors will return partially in Europe, which is fundamental. Thank you. And uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I would like to go on with the discussion. I know you raised your hand, but I, and I think another example of what Europe procured recently was gas as well, right? Exactly. So we're seeing that as well. And speaking about gas, so Fokli, I would like to come to you because, uh, you know, I have two people here essentially who are saying we're well, building renewables flat out. Uh, we also have a professor with us who is essentially explaining to us how the economics and the dynamics have evolved. You are going into a transition fuel. Tell us a little bit about the role of transition fuels in the European economy and maybe also give us the Greek perspective of what it means for a market like Greece where, you know, because a lot of people when they think about greening industry, they're like, oh yeah, in Germany, in France, we're able to do it, but maybe a peripheral market like Europe is not necessarily able to go straight from whatever they're burning today to burning a cleaner alternative. Correct. So I, I'm afraid that I can't answer the question before um, informing our audience very quickly about what we do because we're uh, not uh, uh, RWE or, or NL where everybody knows what they do. Um, so uh, Blue Grid is the company I represent. We deliver clean fuels to uh, customers at the point of use, clean fuels meaning LNG, um, bio LNG, uh, hydrogen, or ammonia in the future. Um, and we deal with the very hard parts 
of the market to decarbonize, uh, which is uh, the parts of industrial use, um, transport, and maritime shipping. Um, and uh, one of the first things we're trying to do is use what we have available today, which is used to be cheap natural gas. Let's hope it becomes cheap again uh, very quickly. Uh, we believe that this is a way to quickly displace um, competing fuels that are more expensive and definitely more polluting. Fuels like pet coke, heavy fuel oil, diesel, marine gas oil. These are all used in huge quantities today in industry and of course transport and shipping. So the first thing we need to do and the first fuel we consider as a transitionary fuel is LNG, which allows us to deliver natural gas to those remote locations where the pipelines do not go, allowing us in turn to um, switch large industrial customers from Petco, which believe it or not has still a huge market share, um, and all these other fuels. And this will not be possible if gas is not competitive. So we need to look at ways to make gas cheap again. Um, hydrogen is great, but at the moment it's very difficult to switch an industrial customer to hydrogen. Same thing applies for transport and shipping, by the way. Um, let me also mention that LNG supply chains, once installed, they rely on cryogenic equipment, on trucks, on storage tanks, on regasification, or gas engines if we're talking about uh, trucks or ships. They can be used as is for bio-LNG. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with bio-LNG. Bio-LNG is a fully renewable version of LNG. Um, it's basically upgraded biogas, um, and it can be transported using exactly the same equipment, and it is essentially carbonless, essentially. Not 100%, but close to 100%. So that pathway is robust, and it leads us to a scenario which is great. Um, and we have the very hard role today of trying to convince ship owners, for example, to switch to LNG. Nine months ago, it was much easier than it is today. Nine months from now, I hope it is as easy as it once was. What I can say is that alternative fuels like hydrogen and ammonia, even though we believe in them and we wish to supply them one day, even though they hold a lot of promise and a lot of merit, they start being problematic when they become the reason for ship owners, truck drivers, or factories to not switch to LNG, mm. which is definitely more carbon efficient today, and as I said, leads to uh, a carbon-free uh, use through bio-LNG. Let me just add one last thing that uh, I think relates to your question and also to the recent developments, which is that um, the EU, as a response to the situation in Ukraine, has put in place a very, very ambitious plan for biomethane, uh, which we consider the same thing effectively with bio-LNG. It's, at the end of the day, the same uh, um, chemical composition. It is, it is methane. Um, Europe today produces about 3 billion cubic meters of biomethane. The plan is to increase that tenfold to 35 billion cubic meters by 2030. 35 billion cubic meters is about 20% of the 155 BCM, billion cubic meters, that we import from Russia. So it's not insignificant, and it's not a pipe dream. It is available today from agricultural waste, industrial waste, municipal solid waste, landfills, plenty of sources. We can produce this very quickly. The technology is robust. The regulatory framework is in place in most countries, not in Greece yet, but soon it will be. And the commercial incentives are also in place. So I think that we should focus on this today. This is our job. And once we get to, let's say, um, incrementally decarbonize these uses of energy, we can start thinking about new realities and new technologies like hydrogen and ammonia. Quickly, I want to ask you one more thing. When you are switching someone from a dirtier fuel to gas. Can you future-proof that investment? Or is the person after 10 years or 15 years gonna have to change whatever equipment it is they change to burn the new fuel that is gonna be greener or is gonna be cheaper or more sustainable? 
You mean future-proof it commercially or, or uh, in terms of no, compliance? In terms of uh, compliance really? and in terms of being able to actually burn different fuels, right? Because today the reality is we have some things that can only burn one fuel and things that can burn multiple fuels. Yeah. Okay, so with regards to gas, yes, absolutely. Um, somebody installing a gas engine or relying on an LNG supply chain can use the exact same engine in the exact same supply chain to consume bioenergy. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. and, and it's effectively carbonless, I'll repeat that. Um, on top of that, someone switching to gas, consider a ship, for example, in case in 10 years from now they need to retrofit to hydrogen or ammonia, this investment in terms of capex is less than half than it would have been if the ship was a conventional marine gas oil burning ship. So there is a full future proofing if we consider a future where biogas will be, or biomethane or bio LNG will be um, available in ample quantities. In case it is not and we need to resort to other fuels, making the leap from liquid to gas gets you halfway there to fully, let's say, clean options like hydrogen enabled fuels. Costa, if I can come back to you a little bit before, I mean, we're almost running out of time here, but uh, maybe one last quick question. Beyond transition fuels, what are other fuels that you're exploring at RWE and what are some of the merits on which you're evaluating them? Uh, I mean, as I think as a group, uh, the focus is really um, on developing the hydrogen economy. I think when it comes down to LNG, I can only subscribe that it's going to play a, a, a transition role. I would like to comment a bit on the on the on the biogas. I think um, the reason it has not evolved more is related to feedstock security. You know, the projects are in general small. You need to make them bankable. When it comes down to bankability, you need feedstock, and then depending on what kind of projects is agriculture waste or you know communal waste it always comes down you know are you actually able to get a 10 or 20 year uh, feedstock supply contract for a relatively small project and the reality is not in the scale you need so and this comes back to now is the time to look a bit at the framework is there a chance actually to use what is happening at the moment you know the push to try to um, uh, you know reduce the dependency uh, from from gas uh, in Europe by pushing a bit the framework that is required to uh, to get uh, biogas uh, uh, to play a bigger role. In the US it's, it's, it's a bit different. You know, the biogas, uh, biomethane, uh, you know, they're much bigger. Uh, they are 10, 20 times larger than what we are used in Europe. Thank you. All right, being conscious of time, I have one final question. Um, I'm going to address it to all the panelists. Please, looking a bit at the clock, let's take 10 seconds each, give a quick answer. The current crisis, the current price crisis, does it benefit renewables and the energy transition? Does it leave them as it was? Nothing has changed. Does it make the situation worse for them? I'm going to start with you, Theodore, and we're going to work this way. I think, they will, I think it, will be benef it will benefit them in the short to medium term, and it would benefit even more the technologies that need to be developed to complement them. Just very few second, second time observations. Uh, even if you build this um, uh, manufacturing station, what I was telling is not just the technologies, that the minerals that you're going to use, if they're importing 100% by China, yeah. you're still going to have a problem. And the EU coming as an ol oligopsony to buy the minerals, at that point, would be too late. The problem would already be there. Europe hasn't bought any gas, by the way. They're trying to figure out how to do it. Sorry, do you mind if we go on and we can have this conversation afterwards Fine, offline, just, just so everyone gets I, a I chance to I say one final thing? Seconds, yeah. Sure, thank you. Uh, the Post answer is uh, straight, yes. Keep in mind that what we're experiencing now is a combination of high <laughs> gas prices, high CO2 prices, and before the war, actually also weather related. Uh, so the answer, but the, 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 the answer is yes, it's going to benefit, uh, you know, the, the deployment of renewables. I, I also think yes. I hope to be yes, actually. Um, as we discussed, one, permitting acceleration 
to grids, digitization, and uh, exploitation of its full potential together with the right policies by the different governments and the regulators are needed. And stable regulatory frameworks are fundamental to that direction. Thank you. So for clear, sorry, one yes or no answer here, and then we can wrap it up. We talk. benefit renewables, but it's bad for everything else. We need cheap gas to get rid of coal. So okay. I think it's a, that's an objective. Thank you. And on that note, I want to thank you, everyone, for being here today. <laughs> See you all.